good evening everyone we are excited to have apil arora as our speaker today he is currently a phd student at the national university of singapore before that he completed his bachelor's degree from iit kanpur and masters from cmi his research focuses on complexity theory and property testing today he'll be talking about his work on low degree testing over reals with this i hand over to him. thank you rishi Welcome and uh, thank you for taking time out to attend this talk at a very late hour. So I'll be talking about low degree testing over the reals, and this is a joint work by Adnan, Noah, SC, and UG. Okay, so uh, let, let me motivate this question by uh, uh, an exact decision problem that we, we wish to solve. So you are given a function f via our Oracle axis. So the Oracle returns f of x for any x that you send it to, and the function f is on a finite domain. It's an n-varied function and takes value also in that finite domain. You want to test whether this function is an element of this arbitrary subset P. So P P denotes the set of properties. So for for us, P will be the set of degree d polynomials. But for the moment, let let P be just any arbitrary subset. And you want to determine whether this function f is a member of P or not. So the complexity measure with this question, associated complexity measure, is the number of queries you need to make to the oracle. And can we think of an adversarial example such that you need to query all points inside the finite domain? So any, any example? Anybody would like to have a guess? So, can you think of an adversarial example such that to answer this question, that f is a member of P or not, you might need to query all points in the function in the domain. Sorry. Transcendental domain. Sure. Yeah. So, an even simpler is f a constant function. So, your adversary may just tweak f on just one arbitrary point in the domain, and to answer that question, you would need to query f on every point in the domain. Now. This is prohibitive. That is, so you don't want to spend so much queries. So, what can we do? So, how about relaxing some correctness requirements on your algorithm? So, the the shape remains the same. That is, uh, the the p is still an arbitrary uh, subset of the set of functions, but around the boundary of p. You introduce a region of uncertainty. That is, your algorithm is allowed to fail in this epsilon width region. So yeah, and the complexity measure still remains the same. You you introduce randomization to uh, re reduce the number of queries you need to make. What's that? So oh, I, I'll come to that. Yeah. So I uh, yeah as I said. Algorithmic guarantees are still desired in the shaded regions. In this strip, your algorithm is allowed to fail. So th th this was uh, the setup of property testing. Now let's introduce property testing over the reals. So real world data, as uh, you would observe, that in involves physical measurements with varying precision. So such data is better expressed as reals. So, so if it's inside P, you would have a two-sided error tester. But a, a good tester in our understanding should be a one-sided error tester. And th that's what we achieve. Okay. So, okay, real-world data uh, is better expressed as infinite precision arithmetic numbers. That is reals. So examples are temperature, pressure, pH, et cetera. And for functions defined over this kind of data, classical techniques that work over finite domains fall short. So we need to come up with something smarter to deal with these problems. Okay. So before I delve into the techniques and uh, the result, word of caution. So for working with the reals, we will start our algorithm, our work, by assuming a real RAM model. So what do you do in a real RAM model? Memory cells, they can store real numbers. 
infinite precision. Memory I.O. operations with reels also possible in constant time. Oracle I.O. operations also possible in constant time. Infinite precision arithmetic operations, addition, multiplication, and identity tests also possible in constant time. And sampling from continuous distributions over RN also possible in constant time. So th this is the real RAM assumption that we need to make to solve the problem. But we don't stop just over here. We incrementally remove these assumptions as well. Okay. So, so let's uh, start a formal setup. So you are given some uh, distance parameter epsilon between zero and one, the the, the width of the strip in which your algorithm is allowed to fail. And with that parameter in hand, given query access to some bounded function, y bounded, I'll come to it shortly. Over R n, also taking values in R. You want to test if f is a function of total degree t, uh, a polynomial of total degree d, or is epsilon fast from degree one. An example of degree three polynomial over R two. You must be very familiar with all of this. So the notion of fairness, as you asked, is quantified by the distance measured with respect to some sampleable but unknown target distribution b. Or R. And we would say that f is epsilon far from this property p with respect to the distribution p if the function, if the distance between f and p is at least epsilon. How do I define the function? I take any arbitrary element g in p, any degree d polynomial g in p, I sample arbit uh, randomly sample vectors x and p, and the probability that f of, f of x and g of x do not match is what is going to contribute to the, the, the distance between f and p. So think of this as the, the fraction of the mass of b on which f disagrees with an arbitrary degree d polynomial. Okay. So, so this doesn't capture how far the difference is. No, it does. So, so if this was very small, then f would be very close to g, right? Whenever they're different, mm -hmm. they can be very far from each other or very close. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's a hamming kind of distance. Yeah. Uh, it is any distribution. B, B can be any unknown target distribution. B. You, you, you just need query access to B. So we, we solve that problem as well, where you, you want to dis, uh, uh, get, get the idea of how F and G, how far they are in, in uh, subsequent results as well. So, okay, the distance between F and P is defined. And okay, so for this uh, talk, P would be the set of total degree D polynomials in R. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So, boundedness means that the function F is bounded in a large bond. So, large is very large in our case, but so, so think of this as the function f does not uh, go to infinity in inside a large ball. Okay. So, so, so. so. No. So, so in, in a large ball. So. The input is in a large ball. Huh? The input is also bounded. Yeah. So, so if the input is bounded, then the, output the norm of the input vectors are bounded. Okay. Therefore, the function value on that vector is also bounded at most. Like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's the minimum assumption that we need to make to solve this problem. So for this talk, uh, let's just focus on the case that the target distribution is just the uh, normal distribution, standard normal, invariant. And instead of boundedness, which troubles you, just assume analyticity. Uh, would anybody like to uh, guess why analyticity would be a good thing to assume. So analyticity gives us Taylor expansion and Taylor expansion gives us a polynomial representation. OK. So therefore the starting point would be analyticity. And uh, yeah. it, it can be further relaxed to boundedness. OK, so here's the main result. Our exact low degree tester is distribution free assumes no knowledge about D, only sampling access to D is required. 
has one sided error. When F is in P, it always accepts. Predicts with probability at least two thirds, uh, removed far from half. Okay. When F is epsilon far from P. And more importantly, it has query complexity independent of N, only poly in D and one by epsilon. And the, the, the trivial approach, uh, the, the brute force approach, would be to uh, use multivariate polynomial representation to learn a degree D invariate polynomial and verify whether F is close to it or not, which would require exponential in D or order into the D queries. But our approach is just poly in D in one by epsilon and independent of N. So it beats this approach by a long shot. So what is the, how do you make the query? Do we specify an X and Y? Yeah, yeah. So to the oracle, you just send an X and it returns F of X. Let's say my distribution is all concentrated at one point. So, so th th that's good, right? If, if it's all concentrated at one point. Yeah, oh. yeah. So, so yeah. So atoms like distributions are trivial. <laughs> and it's the first to solve this problem over any continuous domain. So before this, it was done only over finite domains. So again, uh, with finite domains, what's the good thing? Anybody would like to guess? Yeah. So that, that's one thing. Uh, the, the query complexity is trivially bounded by the size of the domain. But with finite domains, any function over a finite domain has a trivial polynomial representation. So any function is a polynomial. No, no. An arbitrary, so, so the, the degree of the polynomial over that finite domain is the size of the domain. So after that, it just, the question devolves to reducing the degree. So, but over characteristic zero fields, not so. You, you first need to get a polynomial rep representation. Okay. Yeah, so as I said, uh, the real RAM model assumes a lot of uh, as a, uh, power that is not available in uh, modern computers. So to meet real world machines, we extend our result twofold. So if the oracle can only give you finite precision results, so f of x is not an arbitrary precision real, but some finite precision, then you are, instead of an exact low degree tester, you have an approximate low degree tester. So equality, uh, where I, I said that you could check whether two reals are equal or not is no longer the case. So you just check approximate quality. <sighs> so only finite precision arithmetic operations are required. And in the other hand, instead if your oracle could only be queried now on finite precision points instead of an arbitrary precision vector, then uh, so, so such points would uh, construct what, what, what would be a n-dimensional lattice. So for this case, we designed a discrete load if test. And for this case, uh, instead of sampling over continuous distributions, we only sample over discrete distributions, but with infinite support. Okay. So a bit of history. Uh, uh, the, the the field of property testing was started by uh, Blum, Ruby, and Rubinfeld in their classical result VLR test, which basically solved uh, testing linearity over finite groups. And from linearity, you go to degree D polynomials. So low degree testing over finite fields, done by a lot of people with applications to PCBs. And a bit more closer to home, instead of finite fields, you want a, uh, an, uh, a continuous field, but still finite subsets of those continuous fields. So low degree testing over finite subsets of rationals was studied by Ruben Feld in Sudan and uh, also TV managers in Sudan. So Santa's, uh, th this publication is a very uh, good resource if you wish if to study uh, low degree testing. So, so it's, it's a very comprehensive uh, survey. And more closer to home, our uh, co-authors solved the problem of uh, distribution-free linearity tester 
linearity testing over R. So D is equal to one was solved by them. So okay, uh, let's jump into uh, the nitty gritties. So what, what tools do we use? So the first tool, we we wish to solve uh, the problem of deciding whether an n variate function is a degree D polynomial or not. So n variate is a little bit hard to tackle. So we go from n variates to univariates via restrictions. So how do we define restrictions? You take arbitrary lines in Rn. They can be expressed as uh, linear combinations of vectors A and I plus A and P. So B is the direction of the line and A is any point on the line. Once you have a line, you restrict F on this line. So this restriction is of this form, F of A plus X P. So this is the restriction of F to the line L. And it's easy to verify that if F were a degree D polynomial, then for any A and B, F sub AB, which is the restriction of F on that line, is a degree D univariate polynomial. Since each monomial in F sub AB has X degree at most T. Okay. So if you're just testing over random restrictions, if you're given a degree D polynomial to start with, the test will always pass because if F is in P, then the restrictions are also degree D polynomials. So it's a one-sided uh, one error test. So we've climbed down one step of the complexity ladder from n variate polynomials and n variate functions to univariate functions. What do we do with the univariate functions? So testing of univariate degree D polynomials is via the derivative. So calculus 101, the, uh, a degree D polynomial has its D plus first order derivatives all identically zero. But derivatives are defined as limits. And the only query that you can do to the function is via its oracle, not its derivatives. So the derivatives are not finitely computable in our model. So how do we do this? Uh, how do we tackle this problem? Instead of using the derivative, we use the finite forward difference operator. So the, the derivative is replaced by f of x plus h minus f of x. So the, the, this is the first order finite forward difference at step size h. Okay. And how is it related to the derivatives? Calculus 101 again. So it's the ratio of the finite forward difference with the step size. And in the limit, h going to 0, it, it becomes a derivative of And higher order finite forward differences are defined inductively. So if it's univariate and degree, yeah. uh, by D points I can write out this polynomial. Precisely. And uh, I just need to do one or epsilon times. Yeah. To get one point which is bad. Right. And I can just uh, D word epsilon or something I can Yeah, yeah. You, you, you are on the right track. Then why, why am I not on one? Step one, I can definitely test whether it's a univariate degree D polynomial or not. Okay, so so, so it, it'll be just for that univariate, right? So 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 the guarantee you'll get is only for that univariate. No, so so you, you you'll take some random restrictions, right? Yeah. And test whether it's D plus first order finite forward difference is zero. The confidence you get via that is only for that yeah. line. So you, you need to get a confidence for the entire space. Yeah. So, so, so union bound is over again an infinite space of choices, right? right? No, no, no. Yeah. So, okay. So, higher order finite forward differences are defined inductively. So, the mth uh, order finite forward difference is that when you expand this out, it, it gets this nice combinatorial form. So you have summation m choose i f of x plus i h with alternating signs. And these combinatorial coefficients with alternating signs we, we just removed by alpha i. So, so this representation might be familiar. Pascal's triangle. Anybody? Yeah. So, okay. 
So characterization of degree D univariate polynomials that that is the backbone of this tester. So you you take this open interval a comma b and a function g from a comma b taking values in R. Let it be a continuous function. Then for all points x in inside the open interval as well as sufficiently small offsets h such that these points x x plus h x plus 2 h up till x plus b plus 1 h all of them should be inside the interval a comma b your d plus first order finite forward difference at the step size h should be zero if that's the case then g is a degree d univariate poly so so Precisely these points x x plus h up till x plus d plus one h are the arguments for g over here. So you you want all of them to lie in the interval a comma b because the, the guarantee that you want is that g which is from a comma b should be a degree d poly. You you don't worry about points outside a comma b. So this follows from uh, an old result by Cauchy who showed. Uh, the characterization for continuous linear functions. So if D would be one over here, you would get essentially three terms, which is precisely this characterization. Okay. And Frechet, uh, Frechet improved upon this to get uh, the above theorem for arbitrary degree D, but for continuous functions. And a further relaxation, which which is what is what we use was by Sizilski, who relaxed this from continuous to bounded functions. Okay. So uh, just a brief uh, overview of what the tester actually does. So it rejects if the characterization test rejects. The characterization test is precisely this. It, it ra the, the characterization test randomly samples lines A comma B Tests whether the d plus first order derivative is identically zero on that line. Yeah, and if not, it rejects. So yeah, and then uh, once you pass this characterization test, your algorithm gets a sufficient confidence that the function is sufficiently close to a degree d poly. So how close? You, you develop this query g uh, subroutine. Which measures which measures the distance between f and a nearby closed degree d poly. So yeah, if query g and f of p do not match, then also you have found a witness that f is not a degree d poly, and therefore you reject. And in the end, if none of these rejections cause a rejection, then f is reasonably close to a degree d poly. That's what we should. And observe that this query G, which defines a function G, is called only when characterization test passes. So this will be useful later. Okay. We also have access to distribution. This one. The sampling P from the distribution. Yeah. So so you have sample access to D. The, the, the two types of uh, uh, queries you can make. One is like. Specify the XYZ and so on. Right. And you get a sample. And yeah. you can also sample from the distribution. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the only handle that you have on the distribution is just sampling access. On the function, you need query access. Yeah. So, query of G of P, it samples some points around P and it constructs a function G around P, uh, at P, in fact. Such that G should be a degree D poly. So, so what what it does is, if f of p does not match G of p at that point, you 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 get a sufficient confidence that G must be not a degree D poly. So, so query G uh, so, sort of constructs a a, a nearby polynomial. Okay. So the CAT test is basically what, what I said. It samples point uh, samples points and uh, di directions randomly, and on those line restrictions, it tests whether the characterization holds or not. So observe that all these samplings. So over here, sampling sample P and Q from multivariate Gaussians. So observe that all these Gaussians 
they are centered at origin N nowhere else so so th this is also uh, is crucial in the algorithm design because you can't uh, so so in order to gain confidence over a space your algorithm can't uh, test or, or can't sample over that over that continuous space right so so it has to be a finite sort of thing so so th this is what it does a and it's only from uh, yeah sufficient uh, some scale gaussians not nothing it's This is the characterization test, and so the 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 function g, which is a self-corrected function, self-corrected version of g, uh, is constructed in this fashion. So, g is a degree d polynomial from R into R such that if f were a degree d poly, then f and g would be identical, and for all points p in R and g p should be efficiently computable only via queries to f. So the, the the intuition is G is what F would have been had it been a degree D point. So so the the farther F is from P, the, the the larger the distance between F and G. So it's used to estimate the distance of F from P, because when F is epsilon far from P, the distance between F and G should be at least the distance between F and P, which is at least epsilon. So it's defined incrementally. Uh, we'll come to its definition in a moment. Any questions till now? So uh, we significantly extend the BLR test. Uh, so let, let's go through that for a moment. So the BLR test uh, tests for linearity. It works for any functions f over uh, fi finite groups. But for the moment, let's assume that f is a invariant uh, Boolean function, taking values also in f2. So what it does, it, it samples x and y uniformly over the hypercube and rejects if f of x is not equal to f of y plus f of x minus y. So if f were linear, then the right hand side would be always equal to f of x because f of x minus f of f of x minus y would be equal to f of x minus f of i and this would cancel out. So g, the self-corrected version of f, is defined as the majority of g y of x. So g y of x is nothing but f of y plus f of x minus y. And y is also uniformly ran, uh, sampled over f2 to the f. So yeah, if f were linear, then g y of x for all y's would be equal to f of x. So the majority would be trivially g of x. Oh, so, sorry, it, it would trivially be f of x. So g and f would be identical. If not, you can think of each y contributing an equal vote in deciding g of x. So g of x is a majority, and each y being uniformly sampled over f2 to the n contributes an equal vote. And observe that over f2 to the n, as long as x is sampled and y is uniformly sampled, uh, x is fixed and y is uniformly sampled, x minus y is also uniformly sampled. Okay, so y is uniform, x minus y is uniform because x is fixed. So when we wish to extend this technique over continuous domains, uniform sampling becomes a problem because there are no uniform distributions over that. So here uh, the standard normal Gaussian comes to a rescue. Because if y was sampled according to n0i, as long as x is fixed, the difference x minus y would also be distributed according to n0i. Now, okay. And this cute uh, proof, uh, this cute little lemma that as long as uh, the the variances of two distributions are the same, 
the the total variation distance between translated Gaussians is bounded by at most the translation times the scale of the Gaussian. So th th this is very useful. So okay, as long as so we want to bound this. So as long as x the norm of x is small, n uh, x i can be approximated by n zero i for, for testing purposes. So th th this is why I said that in the characterization test, we only sample from Gaussian centered at the origin, nowhere else. And to ensure uh, X is small, what we do is we radially project points X in Rn into a small open ball of radius R. So this is precisely the small open ball and arbitrary points are radially project and the radius r of the ball is inverse poly AD. so roughly 1 by d to the 6 suffices for, for, for our analysis okay so now we define g and uh, g the, the query g was called only if characterization test passes so definition of g is dependent on the characterization test failing with small probability Okay. So for points B inside the small open ball, G is defined again identical to the BLR test. It's a majority value of G cube P's, where Q's instead of uniformly being sampled are sampled according to N0i. And G Q P, uh, recall that, yeah, over here G Y of X was just f of y plus f of x minus y. Now, instead of linearity, we are tackling with degree d. So GQP having, instead of having two terms, has this plethora of d, d plus one terms. But the, the, the idea is that this alpha i g of p plus i q, i f going from one to d plus one, is all part of the d plus first order finite forward difference. So th therefore, th this right hand side comes in. OK. So, so you, you can think of um, what we are doing over here is fix some P. You take our, our direction Q. Once you have these points P and Q, these points P, P plus Q, P plus 2Q, P plus 3Q up till P plus D plus 1Q. They all lie in a line along one line. And these points uh, m minus p, so p plus q, p plus 2q up till p plus d plus 1q, they give you a degree d univariate polynomial on this line. So for g to be a degree d poly, it must be consistent with the value learned by these d, d plus 1 points. So th 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 that's all this gqp being defined this way does. Okay. And GP being the majority of uh, GQPs also is crucial so that if this were to be a degree D poly, then for a majority of Qs, GQP is good. It, it's a degree D poly. So existence of this majority, which is really a mode, is guaranteed by CAT test passing with high probability. We assume that CAT test passes with high probability. OK, so this was for points B inside the open ball. For points B outside, we, we don't need to go through this convolution, co convoluted fashion. We just define GP via radial interpolation. So radial interpolation is along a line, uh, a radial line connecting the origin of P. What do I mean by that? So for a point P, you join it to the origin and take the intersection of the line with the ball of radius r. Now it's a real space, so reals are dense. So no matter how small r is, you will always find d plus one distinct points inside the intersection. And once you have these d plus one points, you just learn the the polynomial representation of this line of, of this line restriction and ex extrapolate the value of 
the polynomial for any point. So yeah. Okay. Questions. So this is for any point P outside P zero R. So once we have defined G, uh, let's prove that G is in fact well defined. That is the majority in in fact exists. So th this also depends that on the uh, cat test passing with higher probability. So yeah, we first show that for any point P inside the open ball, GQPs match each other for a majority of Qs that are sampled on, from the same versions in the cat test. So the arguments involved uh, include low bounding collision probabilities. So so essentially what you want to do is you take random vectors Q1 and Q2 and you want to show that G of P on these directions Q1 and Q2, they match with high probability. So the probability that they don't match is upper bounded by a poly in D rho and R. So D is a degree, R is a radius, and rho is the probability that CAT test fails. Okay. So rho being small, D being bounded, and R is something that you set to make this small. Yeah, and this step crucially relies on the norm of P being small, and it also sets R. So once you have that norm of P is small, then GP inside the open ball B0R is well-defined. So once you have well-definedness in, inside the ball, we want to show, show that G inside the ball is a degree D invariant polynomial. How do we do that? So G is defined incrementally. So the process to say that it's a good degree D poly should also be incremental. So first we prove that G's restrictions on any line segment inside B0R are degree D univariant polynomials. So, so imagine that you, you have this small open ball. You take arbitrary line segments inside B0R. G restricted on these line segments. So remember, G is defined via the majority root. So it's not so straightforward. So G's restriction on these line segments should be a degree D univariate poly. So that follows from basically the character test being uh, successful with high probability. OK, once you have that uh, on line segments, it's a degree D poly. You want to construct a degree D invariant representation inside the small ball. So not, not exactly inside the small ball, but uh, inside a small hypercube contained inside the small ball. And that follows from short zipper lemma. So once you have that, it's a degree D invariant representation inside the hypercube, you want to extend this representation to all points on RN. And the technique for that part is extrapolation. Okay. Questions still now? Okay. So I will not go into the details because it's, yeah. So proving uh, G is a univariate degree D polynomial on all line segments involves proving this theorem. Uh, and the argument follows the approach by Ruben, Fred, and Sudan in the paper. What, what they do is you want uh, this G of P plus IHQ to be replaced by G of P plus IHQ, but in the direction G of Q1 plus IQ2. So, so this replacement is sort of uh, different for different arguments. So as I varies, your direction for replacement also varies. And you want to do this for all i's inside this sum. And once you do this, after a little bit of algebra, this vanishes. So you are able to show that. Okay. So yeah. So yeah. And again, this depends on norm of p and q being small. So therefore, for every p and q inside the small ball, not outside, you are able to show that. OK, uh, so. First step, 
characters guarantees gives us this part. Let's move on to the next part. We want to construct a degree D invariant representation on the hypercube. Okay. So basically, what you do is stitch together a representation, uh, a degree D invariant representation. The proof is via induction. So you construct this hypercube inside the small ball and n uh, dimensional hypercube. So take the nth direction of the hypercube, label it xn, take d plus one slices perpendicular to the nth direction. So yeah, these d plus one slices being uh, n minus one dimensional hypercubes in, in themselves by induction hypothesis, g on these slices would be a degree uh, n times d minus one, n minus one varied polynomial. Okay, so, so the first task is construct a degree nd representation, a degree nd n variate representation. So by induction hypothesis, it will be a degree n times d minus one, d minus one varied polynomial. Uh, sorry, n minus uh, n minus one varied polynomial. Yeah. So, so. On these slices, you have these uh, po polynomial representations for G, and in the nth direction, you take this line parallel to th that direction and construct a univariate representation for G's restriction on this line. So univariate in the formal variable Xn. Okay. So via uh, short zipper lemma, we are able to do this and I won't go into the details so that uh, finally we get a degree nd n variate representation in, in, inside the hypercube. Yeah. And then uh, the degree is further lowered from nd to d via radial argument. Okay, so at the end of this step, inside this pink region, g is a degree d n variate polynomial. What can you say about the green region? The, the region B0 R minus H. And is think radially. Remember, in the pink region, it's a degree D n varied polynomial. In the green regions, all restrictions are univariate degree D polynomials. So just compare the restriction on a radial line. So, so a radial line would intersect the pink region as well as the green region, right? Inside the pink region, it's a degree D invariant representation. Inside the green region, it's a degree D univariate representation. Uh, the density of reals, both of these representations must match as well as short circle lemma. So the degree D invariant representation must also hold inside the green region. Okay, so till this step, we have proven that G is a degree D invariant polynomial inside B0R. What about outside B0R? <laughs> the final step. Somebody guess? Anybody? Think interpolation. So remember, G outside the ball was defined by interpolation on values inside the small ball, right? So if values inside the small ball are a degree D invariant, invariant polynomial, so extrapolated values should also match that polynomial representation. That's it. So we have shown that G on Rn must be a degree D invariant representation polynomials. Questions? So summary, the query complexity is t to the five plus d squared by epsilon log one by epsilon, very close to what you said. Uh, d to the five is contributed by the CAT test and one by epsilon log one by epsilon is by the distance measurement function. Assumes a real RAM model. It's multivariate polynomial interpolation, which requires order into the queries. And now we'll talk about the extensions. For uh, the extension that I mentioned, the, this exact tester is modified 
without affecting the query complexity. Is it complexity of linearity? So complexity of linearity testing is yeah. So one by epsilon long, one by epsilon. Yeah, yeah. It, it matches. So approximate uh, low degree testing. So instead of having exact computations over infinite precision arithmetic, you have finite precision numbers. So you can you can view this as the oracle gives you some answers, but the channel on which the answers are communicated has noise. So noisy outputs by the oracle are handled in this model. So we accept the function f if you have some uh, degree d poly h hat such that for every point inside the domain f and h hat are at most alpha far. So alpha is the level of noise inside the channel. Okay. And you reject if so over there you had that f and h hat don't match Rishi. In, in the exact test so you had f and h hat don't match over here they are far beta far with probability at least epsilon. Yeah, so this is a natural extension of that. OK. And we test F for the characterization approximately. On, there, there we tested the characterization exactly. Here it's approximate. And we prove that if a prox cat test rejects with low probability, then also we can construct a degree D n varied polynomial close enough to F. Uh, in the exact tester, we were able to construct a degree D invariant polynomial that exactly matched F, but here it's close enough. So, more formally, okay. So, th this is the closeness over here. So, uh, it's a hard to read thing, but the parameters are not so good. So, the closeness is exponential in N and doubly exponential in D. So th this is the best that we were able to achieve till now. Uh, yeah. And significantly it uses properties of Chebyshev polynomials for proving closeness. Chebyshev polynomials are maximal polynomials concerning some matrix. Won't get into the details of that. And approximate tester assumes that this distribution D over which we test isn't diffused. So what do I mean by that? So you should be able to get a radius R such that let's say at least 99% of the mass of D lies inside a ball of radius R. So just think if, if the distribution is D, you may keep on approaching infinity and you're not able to sample fr from the distribution, right? So testing with respect to those distributions is just pointless. So yeah, you assume that D is diffused. And instead of majority to define G, you use median because medians are more robust to noise. OK, so that completes the first extension. Uh, second extension where you are able to only query the oracle on uh, finite precision points, the discrete case. Uh, yeah, so the, these lattice points are uh, supported by this discrete Gaussian. So instead of a normal uh, Invariant Gaussian. We have their discrete cousin, cousin GLS. And S is the width of the discrete Gaussian, which, which is the counterpart of the variance parameter over here. So, so imagine that you have an invariant uh, Gaussian distribution and you impose uh, an invariant n-dimensional lattice z, z to the n multiplied by a smooth uh, a fineness parameter. When you impose that lattice over the distribution, the points on which the lattice intersects with the distribution are precisely the points inside uh, supported by GLS. On all, all other points, the distribution is zero. Yeah, so the, the law for GLS is precisely this, which is identical to the law for N0i. And uh, the the cute fact that we used uh, for exact testers, where uh, N0 Ki and A Nx Ki, the total variation distance between them was bounded by uh, the norm of X and K, has a counterpart over here. So what, what do we do on a fine enough lattice 
minute, minutely translated discrete Gaussians. The translation X is small. Can in turn be approximated by corresponding centered discrete Gaussians. So again, instead of G being centered over arbitrary points, we only need G centered over the origin for our tester. And the discrete tester also doesn't assume uh, D is in uh, also assumes that D is in diffuse. And uh, it also requires query access to F on a final address. So let, let's say that you want to test whether F supported on L is a degree D poly. Not only does it require query access to F on L, it also requires query access to F on a refinement of L. So it, it, it's, it's something that we couldn't resolve, but we, we assume that it's there. OK, but more importantly, it doesn't require F to be bounded at all. So bounded assumption is done away. And this is an interesting application of discrete Gaussians outside of flat space cryptography. Open questions. Uh, tightness is unresolved. So the only lower bound is a trivial lower bound, omega max of one by epsilon t. Well, uh, all communication complexity techniques fail when you want to extend them over to the re reals. So something new is needed. And our parameter gap, beta minus alpha, for which the approx system works, as I said, exponential in n and doubly exponential in d, is something that needs to be scaled down. And the screen tester, as I said, the Oracle queries to f on f, refinement of it. That is uh, very non-intuitive. Maybe it can be removed. Yeah. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, last in the class. Mm -hmm. oh. So, so which part did you next slide? Slide. Last question. Oh, so discrete tester requires Oracle access to F on a final address. So, oh, okay. So, say that uh, you want to test whether F supported on a lattice L is a degree D poly or far from it. To answer that question, you not only need F, like Oracle access to F on L, but on refinement of L. So let's say like the, the refinement is like half L, one by three L and so on. So you, you need uh, th th those kind of Oracle queries as well. More questions, comments? You have yeah. access to both distribution and you can specify the price and make queries, right? Yeah. So can you get rid of making, let's say if you are so make the distribution? Yeah, so, so if, if you are uh, only in the sampling only model, not a query model, yeah. I think it's harder. Um, so. uh, not, not that. So, so, so imagine that um, your adversary hides in points which are hard to sample. Slightly. Yeah, but but uh, again, um, so so what, what I understand is these are macroscopic properties, right? So if you perturb the function somewhere, it might change things over other points which are easier to sample. So yeah, qu query access is something that is needed. Okay. Not Not Our paper is accessible over here. Thank you for your time. Happy Lodi, Makasankranti, Pongal. Thank you.